Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome to Aging Well. You know, it's May, so the second Tuesday of every month, that means I'm so glad you're here with us again on this second Tuesday. As always, I have to thank our team, Tom Roth, Courtney Hayes, Audrey Belfar Audrey Belfaro, you're all rock stars, and you truly are the brains behind this operation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I have some news to share with everyone. Uh, I learned, oh, a couple of weeks ago that Aging Well is the recipient of the Winston-Salem Chronicles Community Service Award. And I could not be more proud of everyone's effort uh, that's gone into making this what it is. And I'm just delighted. And I know that in past years, they have had this wonderful, beautiful event, gala event. Uh, this year, out of an abundance of caution, it's going to be virtual. So what I'm going to do as soon as I get the information, uh, the, the event is supposed to occur in May. I am going to send the link out to everybody so y'all can see and, and join in the celebration, if you will. So anyway, but thank you all. You know, again, if y'all weren't here joining us, we wouldn't have anywhere to go on the second Tuesday of every month. So thank you so much for y'all. Thank you for being here. Um, we have got a wonderful program tonight and uh, we're gonna lead off with Chef Alex Governale. He is the executive chef of Butcher and Bull Restaurant in downtown Winston-Salem. And I want y'all to pay attention because I think this is a first for us that he literally started the meal and plated the meal completely without edits in 13 minutes. So that should inspire all of us that, that this can be done. It, it, you know, again, I'm a pescatarian. He was gracious and invited me to enjoy it, but I had to politely decline. But I will tell you, it smelled phenomenal. So, and also he said we could recreate the dish with maybe a salmon filet. So there's hope out there to, to have this delicious dish for people like me. So without further ado, Chef Alex, let's take it away. Thanks for having me, Deb. We're here with Aging Well. I'm Chef Alex Governale down here at Butcher and Bowl in the heart of downtown Winston-Salem. And today we're gonna make a beautiful flank steak for you. <clears throat> we got a local flank steak from a farm here in North Carolina called Brass Town Beef. I love shopping local as much as possible. I always can get you some of the best products and some of the best produce you can get. To go with that, we're gonna do a little bit of an avocado cream and a corn and black bean relish, kind of warmed up. So what we're gonna do first is we'll create the spice rub for our flank steak. So I got a few seasonings here. We got about a tablespoon of salt, pepper, and ancho chili powder. And then after that, we have about a tablespoon and a half, roughly, do how much you like your garlic, of garlic powder and paprika. And then last, we have about a teaspoon of cumin and onion powder. So we're gonna go ahead and give that a mix up. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and unwrap our flank steak here. Try to get you a nice even cut your butcher can do it or if you need to you can do it yourself save your trim you can always use it to make something like a beef stew when it's a little colder or you can use it to even make your own homemade beef stock so what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of our seasoning here get it nice and coated on all sides and then we're just going to let that kind of sit for a sec while we get some of our other ingredients together so you're going to want to have it like nice and coated evenly as much as you can. Let me take these gloves off here. We're going to go ahead and get the avocado cream so it's ready for us when our steak is done resting. We'll just be ready to go. So take your knife, your avocado, give it a good peel, twist to pop it off, <clears throat> knock that off. Then I got my blender here. I'm going to take both halves of the avocado. Just take a back of your spoon, scoop it out. And then what I like to do to go ahead and make, a lot, I do this a lot for my own dishes, is I add a little bit of Greek yogurt to a lot of things. Add you a little bit of extra protein and just kind of makes everything creamy and a little tangy. So I have about a quarter cup of Greek yogurt and a quarter cup of heavy cream. 
I know I said healthy, but we got to get the texture right. So go ahead and throw that in there. Got this towel, wipe my hands off. And I have about a tablespoon and a half, two tablespoons of cilantro. It really depends on how much you like cilantro. I'm a fanatic, so I, I add a little bit more on my own. Then we're going to take about half a lime. Squeeze that in there. And about two cloves of raw garlic. If you've got a good blender, it'll chop it all up for you, no problem. I'll slap this on the blender real quick. And helps if you turn it on. And we're gonna add we're gonna add just a Slide that back in frame, make sure you can actually see me. All right, so we got it a little thick. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of oil and kind of blend it in. There we go. And so you're going to have a nice, almost sour, kind of thick sour cream texture, and we're going to put that on the plate when we're done. All right, slide that off to the side for a sec. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and start grilling off our steaks. With a flank steak, you want to give it plenty of time to rest. If you don't, it's going to be kind of tough, and the, or we won't have that even cooked throughout. I'm going to just set it right over here on my grill. We'll get some nice marks on it. I'm going to go for a nice medium, medium rare, so we're going to let that go for probably about three minutes a side, and then we'll flip it and see how it's See how it looks. I wish you could be in here with me. That smells pretty great right now when it hit the grill. Alright, so we're going to go ahead and get our corn salsa together. So we're going to take a pan with a little bit of your neutral oil like canola or avocado oil. Get the grill going. About a medium, medium low. Don't want to get it too hot. While that preheats, we're going to chop up our onion. Ends off. Straight through. Take a peel. So I'm going to go pretty rough chop on this. I don't want it too fine because we want to make sure our onions don't burn. So I'm just going to go one through the middle. And then a few through that. That should be about enough. You're going to want about half, half an onion worth. I'm going to set that off to the side. And so first we're going to start with our corn because I want to get our corn a little roasted and a little charred. So we're just going to put our corn in there. And let that get kind of heated up. And while we do that, we're going to check on our steak over here. See how we're looking. I'm going to give it like a little half turn so we can make some nice marks on it over there. All right, so now we're just going to kind of let our corn saute over here. You're going to want it to not quite start popping like popcorn, but you're going to want to get a little bit of marks on there, a little bit of color. So next thing we're going to do while we wait on that is we're going to put a little bit of roasted red pepper and tomato into our corn. So we'll go ahead and kill two birds with one stone while that's cooking and get everything together around the same time. I'm going to just go ahead and take, this is just a beef steak tomato. Again, when you can shop local, do it as much as possible. I'm sure there's a local farmer market wherever you happen to be. And as much as possible, we'd love to support local farmers. So we're going to cut it pretty much how we slice the onion. If I'm going a little fast for you, don't worry. There's going to be a recipe online for all of this, so you'll be able to follow along at whatever speed you need. Go ahead and give that a little toss. All right, so you see the pan's starting to get kind of hot. So by the time our onions finish cooking, our corn should have a nice color. So we're just going to go ahead and slide our onions in here. Give that a little bit of a toss. And now this is probably going to be the longest part about making this particular dish is we want to make sure those onions are cooked pretty well. If not, you're going to get that really pungent onions, onion breath, and we don't want that. Let me go ahead and flip the steak one more time. Got some beautiful looking char marks on it over there. All right, so we got the onion diced, we got our tomato diced, and last, we're going to dice up a roasted red pepper. Now, you can, the best way to roast these on your own is if you don't have a nice gas grill like me, is you can put it in your oven on broil, a little oil on it and let it cook for a while and then you pull it out, cover a towel and you'll be able to peel that skin right off and have a beautiful roasted pepper of your own. So again we're just going to cut these into about bite sized pieces. Alright so that's everything together ready to go. So the only things we have left to add to this is going to be our tomatoes, our black beans 
and a little bit of our roasted tomatoes. Our steak is looking great over there. Give it a little toss. All right, so what we're going to do now, we're going to take a look at our avocado cream. All right, slide that out of the way. All right, and just because you're cooking at home doesn't mean you can't make food look beautiful just like we do down here at the restaurant. So I'm going to slide this out of the way a little bit, give us some more working space. We'll set that right there. There we go. So we'll go ahead and make this nice and beautiful just like you'll see at the restaurant down here in Winston. I'm going to put a little bit on the plate. Don't Feel free to be generous. This is going to be your sauce for the steak, so feel free to put on as much or as little as you like. Give it a nice little swoosh. So when you do that, you're just taking your spoon and rotating the wrist a little bit. little trick for you guys there at home. Go ahead and press somebody you love. All right, so there you go. You hear that pop, and that's how you know your corn's getting there. All right, so next we're going to go ahead and add in some of our black beans, about... So this is about two cups of black beans, two cups of corn. Get that tossed together. Add in our peppers. At this point, we're just going to kind of add everything in here so they can get to know each other a little bit. Just give that a few more tosses. All right, let's check our steak over here. We're just about there. I'm going to give it one more rotate so we can finish getting those nice diamond marks. All right, so we're going to steal a little bit of our spice rub, and we're going to add it to our mix here to make sure we're really well seasoned. Add a little bit in there, give it a few tosses, a little more. There we go. You see we're starting to get a nice kind of uniform color from that seasoning mix. It's going to make everything just a little bit orange. Let's get everything a little bit orange with the seasoning mix. All right, there we go. All right, last step for that is we're going to add some more fresh lime juice. I'm just going to... Give about half a lime worth of a squeeze. Really want to make sure we bring that flavor through. This is gonna, we're coming into the hot month, so we want to make sure we stay nice and light with our flavors and really bright. All right, sounds like our steak's done over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this guy over and grab our steak. All right, now this is the hardest part for me. I want to slice into this right now, but you got to let it rest. Trust me. If you don't let it rest, you're going to bleed all over your plate. It's not going to look pretty. You're not going to have that even, clean cook that you're wanting to have. All right, so our mix over here is just about done. So we're going to get a few little garnishes together for our plate to make it look nice. So we're going to take the other half of that lime that we have. We're just going to cut off a nice little wedge. I'm going to take a little bit of our leftover cilantro that we didn't put in our cream. Just give it a nice chop. All right, there we go. All right, so next, let's go ahead, give it a few more little tosses. And now you can cook this pretty quick like I did, or you can really let it kind of go for a little while. But make sure your pan's not too hot, or it'll start to stick to the pan. But you can really let it go low and almost simmer, and you'll get a really nice depth of flavor in there. So we're going to take a little bit of our mix, and we're going to stick it right inside of that little hole we made with our swoosh. Yes, swoosh is the technical term. All right, here we go. So I'm going to throw one more glove on before I slice our meat. All right, let's go ahead and give us a little slice here. So with flank steak and a lot of your meats in general, you're going to see a grain. This one's pretty easy to see because it's run, has a pretty wide open. You want to slice against that grain. That's going to go ahead and cut through the proteins and make your meat a lot more tender. If you cut with it, you're going to be chewing forever. So I'm going to go ahead and just give a few slice, give us a nice, nice medium rare rare over here. Look at that. Then we're going to go ahead and kind of fan it out a little bit. I have it all where it's one, one side and then fanned out. Let some of the juice drain off. Right on top of our corn salsa there. Throw our lime wedge right there. And a little bit of chopped cilantro on top. And that is our ancho rub flank steak with a little bit of avocado cream and a roasted corn and black bean salsa. Again, this is Alex. I'm down here at Butcher and Bowl in Winston-Salem. Really happy that I get to work with the Age Well program and bring this information to you. And also, glad you guys could indulge me a little bit and I got to pretend like I was on the Food Network for a little while. 
So I really appreciate you, t really appreciate you tuning in. And I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you to Chef Alex again. It was wonderful. And um, one thing that I did want to mention, if you don't have a grill handy, maybe outdoor grill, indoor kitchen grill, he said you could uh, sear it in a pan as well to get the same results. You won't have the grill marks, but it will create a delicious dish. So anyway, just in case you don't have a grill, there's other ways to create that wonderful, wonderful entree. So onward, I got in my car and I started driving towards Pilot Mountain. And it was a beautiful drive. And I ended up at Minglewood Farms and Nature Preserve. It is this, this pearl in the middle of these beautiful rolling woodlands. And um, so it is out there for us as a community. Uh, we can enjoy it together. I'm going to, on the other end of this video, tell you about something fun that we could all do together if you're inclined. But uh, Margie Imus and her husband, Bill, started this over 30 years ago. So please join Margie as she takes us on a tour and we can learn a little bit more about Minglewood Farms. I wanna thank Deb and Aging Well for coming out to Minglewood Farm and Nature Preserve today. It's a beautiful spring morning. We've had a good rain this past weekend. The temperature's just perfect. The birds are out and we're delighted to have everybody come visit us here at Minglewood today. We are a working organic farm. We grow vegetables three seasons, spring, summer, and fall here, at, here in Westfield. We are located in the foothills of North Carolina, just right below the Blue Ridge and north of Winston-Salem. But my husband, Bill, and myself, as I said, have been organic farmers here for over 30 years, growing three seasons of produce. We are now a 501c3, a nonprofit outdoor learning center. We're a resource for teachers to connect their students to the natural world through learning, and we love doing what we do. We have a beautiful place to share. We have trails throughout. We have the working farm. We have creeks and meadows. So there's a lot to see and do here. And we're delighted, as I said, to have you visit. We have, we have teachers and their students visit on field trips here to Minglewood Farm and Nature Preserve. We also go into schools, onto campuses, and meet with students and teachers in green spaces in town. Any way that we connect, any way that we can connect students through learning to the natural world, it is a win-win for Minglewood. But we're delighted to have you here today. I'm standing by our new raised beds our farm manager has put in this spring. We're so delighted to have. How they have uh, lots of herbs and edible flowers in them. Behind us, we have my peonies are really starting to come on beautifully. I love the peonies. They always remind me of my grandmother. And we have the annual pollinator garden that's been planted over here that's really gonna be kicking in within the next month or so. So this, during the summer, this space is just beautiful with flowers. I use it for cutting uh, and arranging workshops. We do have a few of those scheduled coming up this summer but it's a wonderful habitat for our pollinators. As you see, we have the beautiful native forest around us too. Uh, there are trails throughout. They are now uh, hosting a lot of visitors coming from South America and Central America. Actually, this week is International Bird Migration Week. We celebrate this on May 14th, and we're delighted also to say that our scarlet tanagers are now here, our wood thrushes have arrived, our indigo buntings have arrived. Some of these birds used to just pass through the farm. Now these birds are staying and nesting throughout the summer. So we just love having these summer visitors come. So hope maybe you guys can spot some today with us or you'll come visit us and see these birds. We have lots of activities to offer here at Minglewood. We do farm tours. We do farm to table meals as fundraisers. One of the most favorite things to do is folks like to come and do flower arranging out of our pollinator garden. They learn about growing flowers. You can learn about cutting them the right time of day and processing. And then I teach you about arranging, how to make a nice arrangement, how to make it last and uh, make it come together with greenery. I often incorporate fresh herbs. 
but we'd love to have groups up for that. So if you guys would like to arrange a tour of Minglewood Farm and Nature Preserve, I invite you to contact Deb or Deb will be reaching out to you and you guys can set up a group visit here to Minglewood because that's how we do it. We do it by groups only, not individual visits because we stay so busy. So it's best to reserve a group to come visit Minglewood and we can take you for a hike in the forest. We'll take you down to the creek and teach you about the waterway that spills here into the Yatkin River and supplies water to Winston-Salem and down beyond. Or we can teach you about our native wildflowers. But one of the most popular is the flower arranging and a farm to table luncheon that's included. So we hope you guys will come visit us soon. And this is our strawberry patch we planted last fall. These are strawberries that came off of runners from last year's plants. I took the pieces, these plants off the runners, planted them in pots, and now uh, Bill and I planted them last fall, and they're doing really, really well. All right, here come these beautiful strawberries. They're just starting to come on. We'll be filling the freezer and supplying just a few restaurants with these beautiful organic strawberries this week. We're so excited to have the season starting up. But we sure have a lot to pick. I'll be doing that this afternoon. To the left of me, over here, you'll see I have our peppers, a variety of peppers. Our farmhand just planted last uh, week. They'll be getting mulched and fenced up. Um, back over here, we've planted tomatoes last week. You've got some blueberry plants over here to my right also. And on above, we have squash and uh, potatoes that are growing very well. All right, we're over here by our beets and our peas. I've got some Swiss chard, rainbow Swiss chard over there that's very pretty too. But I want to talk about a little bit about the rewards I receive, my husband receives, uh, and growing on a farm. And I grew up growing in my grandmother's garden, and I just loved it. It is something that's been embedded in me ever since I was a young person. I reap great rewards from working in the soil, planting the seeds, growing in my greenhouse, or planting the seeds directly onto the farm, into the farm soil and growing these vegetables. It is good for my body to eat these vegetables and it is very good for my mind and my soul to work out here in the outdoors and putting my hands in the dirt. The science has been proven that it is very good for our mental health. I tell kids that visit our farm, you don't have to have a farm. You don't have to have a garden. You can grow vegetables and flowers in a pot on your front porch. You really can. I have grown beautiful flowers. I've even grown tomatoes. I've even grown peas in a pot on my front porch. You can do that too. Let me share a few of the vegetables that are coming off the farm this spring morning. One of which is our snap peas. They're just coming in and they're so beautiful. And the kids that visit, they're so amazed to realize that every flower that blooms gives us a pea. Of course, I have to have my pollinator visit it and make these uh, peas for us, but they're really yummy. I love fresh peas. Okay, another thing we have growing right here is these beautiful beets. We have a gorgeous red beet here. Finish my pea. And I want to share with you guys, we have beautiful orange beets. Look at this. How pretty is that? Further down, we have a chikuga beet. It is a like a peppermint spiral. It has red and white in the inside. So we have beautiful red beets, orange beets, and the pepperminty spiraled colored red and white beet called the chikuga beet. And when we can do specialty items like this, our chefs love them. So I hope you guys will grow some spring vegetables because as I said, here in North Carolina at least, you can grow all four seasons. In the winter time, you can grow lettuce. In the springtime, you can grow a pot of lettuce. You can grow beets in a pot too and be able to harvest those and have a great spring meal. Then replace that potted plant, that spring plant with some tomatoes or a squash plant or a green bean, put it on a pole or do a bush bean in that pot. Or Get somebody, a neighbor, to till a little garden space in your backyard. You too can grow spring vegetables, summer vegetables, and fall vegetables. 
All right, I'm here at the end of our driveway by our brand new sign we're so proud of, marks the entrance to Minglewood Farm and Nature Preserve. But I'm also excited to share with you, I'm also under our service berry. It is a native tree. It blooms, it's a first bloomer at the end of winter with beautiful white flowers. But this year they're loaded with berries. Deb's gonna get a picture of that for y'all but it's loaded with berries. These berries are feeding these migratory birds that are coming in now. It is a very important feeder for all of our wildlife. So it's a great place for us to wrap up today. I hope you guys will plan a visit to Minglewood Farm and Nature Preserve. You can check out our website on the internet, Minglewood Farm and Nature Preserve. You can also find us on social media and Facebook and Instagram under Minglewood Preserve. Please check it out and we hope you'll plan a visit to come visit us soon. Well, again, there was just simply no better way to start my day than at her beautiful garden on that morning. And it was just perfect, just perfect. So one thing that I want to put um, kind of a teaser out there for you, when her pollinator garden gets up and established and blooming, I think it would be a blast if we got together a group from Aging Well, we head up there and uh, she's got parking so we can either carpool and you know take a few extra cars. But um, I just think it would be a blast. We could pick flowers together, make arrangements, and then finish it off with a lovely farm to table meal. I think the hikes around the property would be fun for those who are adventurous and who want to do it. And if not, just sit back and enjoy some iced tea with your lunch. But anyway, I just love knowing these wonderful, wonderful resources are out there. And again, we're outside, we're safe. It, it could not be a more appropriate outing for us all. So I will send some information out on that. And uh, maybe once the, the pollinator garden is up and going, we'll make a date and go up there in force. Aging Well is coming to, to Minglewood. So anyway, thank you, Margie and Bill and Ray the wonderful dog who joined, joined us for the tour. It was just such a perfect day. And so, you know, but we're outside. And so we think about, okay, the weather's warmer. Well, sometimes it's warmer on, let's see, on Sunday, I had on two coats, but hopefully today I'm back in more appropriate weather. Um, we have got a wonderful dermatologist with Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist, Dr. Lindsay Stroud with us. She's gonna be talking about how we can protect our skin because May is Skin Cancer Awareness Month. So Dr. Stroud, we're tickled to death to have you and can't wait to hear what you have to say. Great, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I thought that this would be a really nice time of year to talk about skincare, but to talk about seasonal skincare. So what do we need to do at this point in the year to take care of our skin? I'm going to go through just some kind of basic information about the skin, just to make sure we're all kind of on the same level. And then I'm going to talk about some of the things we need to watch out for as it relates to our skin. And then finally, we're going to end with some myth busters. So trying to figure out uh, if, if some of the kind of common things we hear about sun and, and our skin are, are true or not true. And then I'd be happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so like Deb said, I'm on faculty here at Wake Forest University in the Department of Dermatology. And I love the skin. The skin is fascinating. I'm, I'm passionate about it. And, and I like to think of the skin as really being its very own ecosystem. So it's quite easy to think about, you know, uh, the skin is, is there, it's, it's on the outside of my body, but I don't really know what it's doing. And the more that we learn about the skin, the more we understand how complex it is, um, how all of these different parts come together to kind of uh, provide the basic functions of the skin that we need as human beings in order to live kind of healthy lives. Um, and that has just always fascinated me. So I hope I can share some of that enthusiasm with you tonight. Just touching on some of kind of the basic functions of our skin, some of these you may know, um, some of these you may not, um, but our skin is really the main organ in which we interact with the world. And so it helps us in terms of controlling our body temperature. So there's 
you know, millions and millions of blood vessels in the skin that can dilate when we need to release heat and constrict and contract when we need to retain heat in our body. It of course functions as a barrier. So it, it keeps inside things in and keeps outside things out as we'll talk about in a couple slides. Uh, your skin is extremely highly innervated. Obviously we all know that when you get a splinter in your skin or um, heaven forbid a, a piece of fiberglass or, or you know, a mosquito bite, um, we know it, right? We can feel kind of the faintest touch on our skin and um, it is extremely highly innervated and transmits all sorts of different sensations for us. Vibration, light touch, deep touch, temperature, pain, itch, um, all of these things. So it is a primary sensory organ for our body. Um, and it is our, our first and maybe our most important defense mechanism. It's our first line of defense against kind of all of the potential nefarious things in the outside world that, that really need to stay outside of our body. And, and we'll talk a little bit about the defense mechanism of the skin too. So a lot of times I like to describe our skin to my patients as being a brick wall. And this is a, a microscope image of the top layer of the skin. And so you can see here, there's cells um, that kind of make different layers in the skin. Um, and those cells that are kind of purpley looking have nuclei inside of them. So they're living cells. And at the very top of this picture on the left, you can see there's kind of like a basket weave kind of look um, of pink material. And those are actually dead skin cells. So that is, the top of the topmost layer of the skin. Um, and there are lots of proteins, um, fatty molecules, and, and other types of materials that function as the mortar um, that holds those skin cells together. And so if we have problems with the skin cells themselves, we have problems with the skin. If we have problems with any of the proteins that make up the mortar that holds our skin cells together, we can have problems as well. And there's different skin diseases that we see um, that can impact different parts of the skin. And again, this is just the topmost layer of the skin. There's actually three layers to the skin. Um, when we learn about the skin in, in medical school, we learn about the different layers. So this is called the epidermis. So this is what you're looking at um, here under the microscope. So like I said, this, this outer layer of kind of dead skin cells and the epidermis is really functioning as, as that barrier. So it's keeping germs and bacteria out of our skin. It's keeping um, dirt and um, foreign objects out of our skin. And to a degree, it's going to keep other things out of our skin too, such as UV radiation, which we'll talk about today. Um, it also functions to keep inside stuff in. And one of the most important things that our skin does is it helps to retain moisture. So if, if you have a, a large defect or a large problem with your skin and with its barrier function, one of the major issues patients can have is they can become very dehydrated. So we see that in patients that have burns and other kind of trauma to the skin. And that's because it's really not able to kind of lock in that water and that moisture that we need to keep inside our skin. So we're in May, right? We, despite kind of the chilly weekend that we had, we know that summer is coming soon. It's just right around the corner here in beautiful North Carolina. And it is a time of the year where we really need to pay attention to our skin and, and what we're doing to protect our skin. So I think this is a great time of year for us to have this presentation. And you know, we all start out as these cute little babies um, that have absolutely beautiful, um, spongy, perfect looking skin. And then as we all know, with, with sun and with time, that skin changes. And there are certain parts of our body where we see a lot more of that skin change. And that is usually in the places that have more sun exposure. So our face, our forearms, and the backs of our hands, um, our scalps, sometimes in our upper chest areas. Um, and so we'll talk about kind of why the sun does this to the skin and, and why it can be problematic for us. So one of the main reasons that the sun is, is challenging for our skin has to do with the ultraviolet radiation that the sun produces. Um, so ultraviolet radiation is really divided into three types. So we hear a lot about UVA and UVB. 
but not quite as much about UVC. Um, UVC is actually largely filtered out of our atmosphere. Um, and so it is not one that is as much of a problem for those of us living on the surface of, of planet Earth. But UVA and UVB are not filtered out by our atmosphere. So those are the ones that really can reach us and can cause some problems. Now UVB and UVA are different based on what's called their wavelength. So that's kind of the, the size of the light ray that is coming into our skin. UVA has a longer wavelength and longer wavelengths penetrate deeper into the skin. So UVB rays kind of go to the top layer of the skin, that epidermis that we saw a couple slides back under the microscope, whereas UVA can actually penetrate all the way to almost the bottom of the second layer of our skin called the dermis. And you can see that in this picture here. So this is a cross section of the skin. And you can see that the top layer of the skin here is the epidermis and then these red and blue lines are blood vessels. There are some green nerves um, that are in this diagram. There's a sweat gland in the dermis. So that middle layer of the skin is pretty busy. There's a lot going on. There's hair follicles there. And that's where UVA goes. So UVB is the primary type of radiation from the sun that causes burns. So when you get a sunburn, um, that is usually caused by UVB radiation. UVA, because it penetrates deeper, it breaks down a lot of the collagen fibers that kind of live in that middle spongy layer of the skin. And so while UVA typically does not cause a lot of burns, over time, if you have a lot of UVA exposure, it starts to break down that collagen. And that's why your skin gets thinner as you get older, because when that collagen can't work properly, you tend to actually lose thickness of the skin. So it kind of thins over time. So UVA tends to cause more kind of a long-term damage um, to the skin. Importantly, both UVA and UVB can cause damage to the DNA that lives within our cells. So our DNA lives in the nucleus of our cells and that is the, the blueprint for our body. It's the way that our cells function normally. It's the instruction manual um, for, for our cells to, to know what to do. And so when radiation hits that DNA, it can damage it and, and cause dysfunction to, to that guidebook. Um, and then the cells are no longer acting properly. And that can lead to skin cancer. Um, the other thing that we see that ultraviolet radiation does is it actually suppresses our, our immune system in the skin. Um, so how I like to describe to our patients is our immune system has different parts. Um, you can kind of think about it kind of like a, a police force. There's different parts of the police force that do different things, um, but its primary overarching goal is to protect us. And there is a branch of the police force in our immune system that's kind of the neighborhood patrol. So there are immune cells that kind of constantly drive around, kind of circulate around our skin, and they look for bad apples. They look for things like cells that have been damaged that aren't behaving properly. They look for bacteria or yeast or fungus that doesn't belong in our skin, and they help get rid of those. When you're exposed to the sun, uh, when you have your cells exposed to radiation in the skin, it actually chases away those neighborhood patrol immune cells. And so they're no longer hanging around the skin and they're unable to get rid of those precancer or early skin cancer type cells. So that's one of the reasons why the more sun exposure you get, the more likely you are to develop a skin cancer down the road. And skin cancer is super common. So as dermatologists, one of our primary roles is uh, skin cancer surveillance. We want, we want to kind of check our patients and make sure that we're identifying skin cancers early. Um, if you add up all the types of cancer in the United States outside of what we call non-melanoma skin cancer, um, you have, uh, you can see here that all other cancers combined um, is, is in that light blue section there. Whereas just looking at non-melanoma skin cancer, which is really basal cell and squamous cell skin cancer, that's that dark blue piece of the pie. So 
you can see skin cancer really trumps basically all other types of cancer combined. So very, very common. And one of the ways that we can protect ourselves and be smart about when we need to wear sunscreen and, and help protect ourselves against skin cancer is looking at the UV index. Um, so the UV index is kind of a standard measurement of the strength of UV radiation in a specific geographic location on a specific day. So below here, you can see two different cities. So on the left is Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and on the right is Miami, Florida. And this is a graph. You can see at the bottom of each of these graphs are the months of the year. And it shows you what the average daily UV index is um, kind of at each month in these two places. So there's no surprise in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you know, the having a high or a very high UV index is pretty limited to the summer months, you know, June, July, and August. Whereas in Miami, it's almost always high, very high, or even extreme levels of UV radiation. So it's really only December and January where it dips below into kind of that moderate category. So what this means is that someone living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin does not need to use the same degree of sun protection that somebody in Miami, Florida needs to use. So not every place is created equal when it comes to kind of the degree of radiation that we're receiving. So you can check wherever you live. So we, we live, most of us live in Winston-Salem. I know there's people tuning in from other areas, but if you have a smartphone and you have a weather app, um, if you pull up the weather app on your phone, um, it oftentimes looks like this. Um, and if you scroll to the bottom, it has a, a line down here at the bottom that says the UV index. Um, and this is on a scale of zero to 15. Um, and this will tell you, relatively speaking, how strong the sun is that day. Um, so, you know, less than five is, is pretty low um, of a UV index. So it's going to be pretty hard to get a sunburn um, when, when the UV index is that low. 10 and higher is really high. That's a very high UV index. And so um, if the UV index is that high, then almost anybody that goes outside for an extended period of time without using sunscreen or sun protection is going to get a sunburn. So it just gives you a general idea of kind of how much protection you're going to need on any given day. This is a map of the world. It's kind of like a heat map um, looking again at kind of the cumulative UV um, radiation over the course of a year. Um, and I put a little, you can see this little kind of pink purple star here. That's roughly where North Carolina is located. So um, we are not the worst area in terms of, of UV radiation, but we still get a pretty decent amount. We're kind of in that solid orange category there. Australia is actually the worst in terms of UV radiation. And a lot of our studies and our data about skin cancer risk and how to protect against skin cancer actually originates from Australia. And it has to do with some of the ozone layer depletion um, over Australia, as well as kind of where it is situated um, on our planet. So going back to the types of skin cancer, like I mentioned, they're extremely common. So I just wanted to give you a couple tips about what to look for on yourself that you may, if you notice one of these in yourself or one of your friends or loved ones, you may wanna recommend that they see a healthcare professional to get that looked at. The most common type of skin cancer in the United States is something called basal cell carcinoma, so a basal cell skin cancer. And what I tell patients is this is the vanilla flavor of skin cancer. It's the most common and it's the least scary. So that's the good news about them. Um, they typically come up kind of looking like an acne bump um, that really doesn't go away. Um, so they can be skin colored or kind of pink and kind of have a pearly kind of look to them. They oftentimes have these little tiny blood vessels running over them called telangiectasias and they can bleed pretty easily. So oftentimes patients will come and say, hey doc, I have got this spot, it came up on my face, it's been there for four or five months. I thought maybe it was like an acne bump or a hair follicle that you know got irritated. If I scratch it, it bleeds and it just never goes away. Um, so that's kind of the classic story of, of how these can present. Um, we see them more commonly in patients with lighter skin, um, although any skin type can get basal cell carcinoma, and they are typically in sun-exposed areas. So 
the head and neck area, the chest, the upper back, um, and the arms are the most common places where we see them. Squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common type behind basal cell, but it is much more common in our older patient population. So we see lots of people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s that can develop basal cell, but it's pretty unusual to see a squamous cell that early in life, um, unless they have kind of other things going on. Whereas patients kind of 60s and older, um, we see a lot more of this type of skin cancer. And these usually come up as a sore spot. Um, so they're kind of crusty or scaly looking. They typically are pretty tender to the touch. So patients will say, I had, I can feel it. If I, if I push on it, it, it feels pretty sore. Um, and sometimes you can even get a little ulcer and, and sometimes they can bleed as well. These again are more in sun exposed areas. So scalp, ears, neck, um, face, upper chest, backs of the hands is a common place to see these. And in our female population specifically, we oftentimes can see these on the legs below the knees. Um, so just another place to kind of keep in mind. These um, typically do not spread inside um, to lymph nodes or other places within the body. Um, if they're left for long enough, they can. So they are a little more aggressive than basal cell. Um, but not as aggressive as melanoma. So they're kind of the in-between, um, the Goldilocks of, of skin cancers, if you will, uh, but ones that typically we can remove without much problem. And then there's melanoma. There, I, I should say, there's more than 40 different types of skin cancer. I'm just telling you about the three most common ones, um, but there are many, many uh, fish in the sea when it comes to, to skin cancer. They're just some that are much more uncommon. Um, and melanomas are the scary ones. They're the rocky road ice cream flavor of, of skin cancer. They can come up and, and look many different ways and they can spread relatively quickly to lymph nodes or to other organ systems like your lungs, um, your brain, um, your, your GI tract, like your large intestine um, and other places. Um, there are some things to look for with melanoma. So they typically start out um, as a flat, pretty dark spot. Um, and the cells are behaving very abnormally. So some of them are growing really quickly. Some of them um, are growing much more slowly. And that leads to asymmetry or irregularity of the border. So most moles are round or kind of oval shaped. Um, so if they have kind of a jagged outline, um, that's pretty unusual for one of these. Um, they oftentimes can be multiple different colors. And they usually change pretty quickly over time. So that's a really important thing. If you notice a spot and then a month later, you feel like it's pretty different in how it looks from, from the month prior, it's probably worth having somebody take a look at it. One of my favorite mnemonics for melanomas are flat, dark Florida. So I tell my patients, flat, dark Florida's don't belong on your skin. Um, and that's just saying that most melanomas start out flat. They're usually very, very dark um, and they have a funny shape. So if a mole has a panhandle on it, um, you need to go see a dermatologist and, and get it looked at. Um, and melanoma is becoming increasingly common. Um, so the kind of incidence of melanoma or the number that we see um, every year is rising faster than any other type of cancer in the United States. Uh, we're not really sure if that means it's actually more common or we're just catching them earlier and catching them more frequently. Um, that's a hard thing to kind of um, parse out. But um, regardless, we're seeing it, um, you know, I see a melanoma almost every day that I'm in clinic. So um, they are a lot more common than they used to be 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, so now for the last part of the talk, I'm just going to pivot to just some kind of um, common questions or myths that, that people have about kind of sun protection and, and what they need to do to protect themselves going forward. So, you know, a lot of my patients say, hey, if I'm, if I'm wearing clothing, it's gonna help protect me from the sun and, and I really, I, I don't need sunscreen. Um, and that is true to a degree, um, but of course, you know, not all clothing is created equal. This is an example of bad sun protective clothing. So don't go to the beach and only wear sombreros, um, you know, to protect yourself from the sun. Um, we have to be smart. And the nice thing is that nowadays you can find good sun protective clothing just about anywhere. So Walmart, 
you know, Dick Sporting Good, Target, um, places like that um, have a pretty extensive selection. What you want to look for are kind of tight knit, um, high neck, uh, long sleeve shirts that help protect kind of your chest and upper back as well as your arms. Um, now, a lot of times they actually make ones with a hood um, that you can kind of push up, you know, pull and, and remove kind of up and down, which is really nice as well. Um, and these are usually, you can swim in them. Um, they usually have an SPF 45 or 50, um, and they're pretty lightweight, even though they have a tight knit to them. So they're, they're actually pretty comfortable to wear even in, on the hot days. Um, and then we'll talk about hats in, in just a second, but you want to have a hat that really has a, a, a brim that goes all the way around to protect the back of your neck as well as your ears, um, because ears are a very common place where we see skin cancer pop up. Um, so they actually looked at a study of, of how much sun protection a baseball cap provided. Um, so of course it does a great job of, of protecting kind of the top of the scalp here, um, but it does not provide much sun protection for the rest of the face. So it gives a little bit to the forehead, but not very much on the nose and cheek and certainly none at all if you're wearing it like former President <laughs> Obama's wearing it here. So, um, you know, baseball caps are great, they're convenient, um, but you have to recognize there's some limitations there and what they can do. Um, uh, an average kind of white t-shirt like he's sporting here has an SPF of about five. So it's better than nothing, um, but it's not as good as, as wearing a good um, high SPF sunscreen. So you do, you can burn um, through a cotton t-shirt. You just have to be careful. Um, and we know that, um, that clothing in double covered areas is very protective because it's very, very uncommon for us to see skin cancers in those double covered areas. So this is like something I'm I'm a dork and I think this is really cool. I hope you guys do too. So it's fascinating to me that our cells even recognize that the importance of wearing a hat. Um, so there is a phenomenon called pigment capping, and what you see here on the left is this is a the the brown cell is a melanocyte. So that is the cell that produces pigment, um, and then what it does is it pinches off little packages of pigment into all of the surrounding cells that don't make pigment. And then that pigment is released and it's kind of sprinkled over the top of the nucleus. So this is called capping. And what it does is pigment is designed to absorb UV radiation. That is why we have pigment in our skin. It is like a sponge and it soaks up UV radiation. So our cells actually know that it needs to put that sponge of pigment kind of between the sun coming this way um, and the nucleus kind of sitting here. Um, and that's what you can see in the picture on the right kind of under the microscope. All right, the next one is a sunscreen is a sunscreen. They're all basically the same. Um, and this is not true. A lot of people don't really know what to look for when they're looking at sunscreens when they're in the grocery store or department store and there's a whole wall of them. Um, there's two main categories of sunscreens. There's physical sunscreens and chemical sunscreens. Um, and it has to do with the active ingredient as to the difference. So physical sunscreens are actually, the molecule is a physical blocker of UV radiation and also blocks visible light. So it does provide a much broader spectrum of coverage than chemical sunscreens do. However, sometimes they can be harder to apply. Chemical sunscreens um, work a little bit differently and they have a little bit of a more narrow um, kind of window of UV radiation that they cover. So they cover UVB, part of UVA, but not visible light. So some sunscreens are only physical, some are only chemical, some are actually a combination of both. The problem with chemical sunscreens is some people can actually develop a sensitivity to some of the active ingredients. And so for more sensitive skin individuals, they can be a challenge to wear. The quick way to, to look and know um, is you turn the sunscreen bottle over and you look at the very top under the active ingredients. And if it's a physical sunscreen, it will basically only have either titanium or zinc. Those are the ones that are approved by the FDA in the United States. All other active ingredients will be chemical ingredients by default. And a lot of people ask me, how, how high of an SPF do, do I need to use? Um, and are there certain ones that are better than others? 
So we'll talk about the SPF in a minute, but I will say if you're going to be swimming or engaging at the beach in kind of sports or, or activity, um, looking for ones that are very water resistant or sport products sometimes stick a little bit better um, than non-sport sunscreens. And it usually says on the front of the label how often you need to reapply it, either every 40 minutes or every 80 minutes. So go for the 80 minute sunscreens. And then in terms of what SPF you need to use. Um, so SPF, the, the way that they determine what an SPF is, is they check for this in a lab. So they apply a very thick layer of sunscreen to the skin and then they slowly increase kind of the level of UV radiation that they expose the skin to. And when they can basically at, at whatever kind of interval they can induce a sunburn, that is what the sunscreen label will have. So an SPF of 50 basically means that you need kind of 15 times the sun exposure of non, of non sunscreen skin to burn with the sunscreen. But that is only if you apply it how they test it in the lab, um, which is a lot of sunscreen. So a full to the brim shot glass of of sunscreen is enough for one single application of an average size person um, kind of all over the body. Um, so if you get one of those kind of, you know, Neutrogena tubes or something like that, um, you know, that's about two or three applications of sunscreen. So it doesn't go very far. So what do we do? We end up applying a pretty thin layer. Well, what we know is that, um, you know, if you apply an SPF 30, how most people apply it, it's actually a much lower SPF factor. So it's really an SPF of three or four. So I actually think that higher is better um, because most of us just don't apply it in that thick of a layer to get the true SPF. Should I do it when I get to the pool? Um, the answer is no. Um, it is oftentimes better, especially if you're using a chemical sunscreen, to apply it at least 15 minutes before you go outside. Um, so I usually recommend doing it before you even put on your suit so that we don't have to worry about burning along kind of your bathing suit lines if you're headed to the pool or to the beach. Um, and I, what my family does is we actually put a rub on sunscreen on all over before we go outside. And then we touch up during the day using sticks or sprays because sometimes they're easier if we have sandy hands. Um, but you can use whatever, you know, spray, cream, um, stick, any of those are fine as long as you're applying it in a liberal fashion. And then a lot of people ask about vitamin D. So this is actually a myth. Um, so there's been several studies looking at vitamin D and sunscreen use. And to summarize a lot of literature very basically, um, what they found is that your vitamin D level goes up if you're outside, whether you have sunscreen on or not. Um, if you never go outside, the likelihood of a vitamin D deficiency is higher. But even people that you know, are very good about sun protection that, but spend time outside, have adequate levels of vitamin D. So it's not a reason to not use sunscreen. Sunscreen won't help me, the damage is already done. This is sometimes what some of my older patients wonder about, and this is actually a myth. Um, so there's been some really good studies that look like even, that look at even in middle age and sometimes older age, if you start using sunscreen and we follow those patients over time, it actually decreases the incidence both of pre-cancer skin lesions called actinic keratoses and also for more serious skin cancers like melanoma. So this was another study done out of Australia. So what I tell patients is that we know from, from the research that's been done is it's never too late to adopt good healthy habits. And then finally, just finishing up with um, a myth about base tans. Um, this is actually part, part true. So a tan is, is basically a stress response of the skin. So when your cells are radiated by UV radiation, um, it, it stresses the cells and the melanocytes kind of pick up and make more pigment to try and combat the damage that's being done by UV radiation. So it does help protect you from future sunburns. Um, but the problem is, is that a lot of people, once they get a tan, they tend to slack off on using the sunscreen um, and that can then cause burns or damage down the road. So just to wrap up, these are my recommendations um, that, that most dermatologists are, are, are going to, I think, stand with me on these. Um, I'll say check the UV index even on cloudy days because that's sometimes when people get pretty bad sunburns um, because the UV index can be high even, even with cloudy days. 
And I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm happy to take questions um, if anybody has a question um, and encourage you to check out our website or to follow us on social media as well. Well, Dr. Stroud, I sure thank you for this. Um, it, again, it's kind of a wake up call for me anyway, probably for a lot of people on this webinar. So um, a couple of questions already. So what about African Americans? Are they at as high a risk as Caucasians? Yeah, that's a great question. So we know that um, patients of all different skin colors and types can get skin cancer. Now I will say patients with darker skin types have less risk because they have more pigment protecting the DNA in their cells than somebody that has maybe very pale skin. Um, but we see lots of skin cancers um, in patients with skin of color as well. Some of the most common places that we see them are actually on their palms and soles. Um, so in the parts of the skin that may not have quite as much pigment. Um, the other place that we see them is sometimes in the fingernails and toenails. So those are special places um, in skin of color patients that we see them um, more commonly than in lighter skin color patients. Okay. Do you have recommendations for lip sunscreen? Yeah, lip sunscreen's hard. Um, nowadays, there are a lot of chapstick type products that have a built-in SPF. I know like Aquaphor makes one now, um, and I think Chapstick brand makes one. And I think CeraVe um, has a lip product that has sunscreen in it as well. But it's a good point. Your lips are skin too, um, and they can burn just like the rest of us, uh, the rest of our skin can. And we sometimes neglect um, that part of our body. So it is really good um, to take some chapstick with you to the beach, into the pool, and to reapply it frequently. I know that's where I get sunburn a lot is on my lips. And I think I just yep. kind of forget to yep. apply it there. Okay, are we as, as Wake uh, going to start having community skin cancer screening programs again? Yeah, we, um, we went back and forth about that. You know, we had one every year in May um, for skin, because this is Skin Cancer Awareness Month, um, and we had to stop them due to COVID. Um, we are hopeful that next year we will be able to get that programming back. Um, and typically, we will announce that on local um, news stations. It'll also be on our website um, and usually in the local papers as well. Um, and we're hoping next year we can do one both at our main office um, in Winston-Salem and also at our new office in High Point as well to reach kind of more people. Uh, what about six month old babies? Do they need sunscreen and should they be wearing hats? Yeah, so um, the FDA is um, a little skeevy about using sunscreen in children under a year of age. Um, usually what I tell patients is they're um, great. To, uh, babies are great for some protective clothing. They can model it for the rest of us. So, um, you know, I think a little bit of sunscreen on, on, on an infant is probably fine, like on their face. Um, but their skin absorbs things kind of systemically a lot easier than adult skin or even child skin does. Um, so that's why we're a little bit cautious with our youngest patients. Um, so I usually recommend kind of a, a long sleeve or long pants outfit. And then if definitely a cute, cute little bucket hat for them and, and maybe a touch of sunscreen on their nose and lower face. Perfect. Well, you've sure given me and I think everyone on this webinar a lot to think about. I'm certainly going to, I had no idea the UV index was on my weather app. So I'm going to be paying closer attention to that. Yeah, it's a cool forward. thing. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. Uh, so we just thank y'all. We thank you for being a part of Aging Well for May and make a date for June 14th, because that's going to be the next time we get together. And again, we're always so grateful that you are willing to spend part of your Tuesday evenings with us on the second Tuesday of every month. So we'll see you again next month. Until then, have fun, but let's take care of our skin. Thanks a lot.